somebody scratched his eye and damaged his cornea. Hello YouTube, thank you for clicking on this video and shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and this is Bonsai and welcome to my channel. Bonsai had a little accident the other night. He was in the car and he scratched his face and accidentally got his eyeball while he was doing so. So he has to have eye drops and a cone for the next little while, but he seems to be okay. He's in a lot less pain than he was a couple days ago. So we're getting better, right, Bubaloo? Yeah, we're getting better. We're gonna be better soon. I am a self-taught historical sewist and I recreate garments that I see in fashion plates and portraits and museums entirely by hand using only the tools and techniques that would have been available to a seamstress at the time of the garment's creation. So with that intro out of the way, um, thank you to everyone for your patience. I was supposed to have uploaded a video last week. I'm trying really hard to get videos up every two weeks, but sometimes it's not always possible. Life gets in the way. I was unfortunately unable to post a video last weekend, so it has been three weeks since my last like big video, and I am now past 300 subscribers at the time of filming, so yay, this is awesome. I've only had my channel for a couple months, so I'm really happy at the rate that I'm growing. I'm trying to get to 1,000 subscribers, so if you watch these videos and you haven't yet subscribed, what are you waiting for? We have so much fun here. Uh, well, at least I do. I don't know about any of you guys. Um, thank you as well for all of your comments on my video last week. I asked you guys for your opinion on whether you would want me to do some sewing tutorials or some more history videos. And a lot of you said that you wanted to see the sewing tutorials, but then a lot of you also said that you enjoyed watching the history portion because you watch that in the background as you sew, which, hey, is what I do as well with other people's videos on YouTube. It was a pretty even split, so I'm going to take that as just keep doing what you're doing and we'll just sort of figure it out from there. I will be filming a project update for you guys. I've started a new one and I honestly kind of hate it, but I'm going to be filming that for you guys probably next week, so you'll get that in the next video. Also, I got new eyelashes and they are like super dramatic. Like I just, I was not expecting them to be quite this like, hello, eyelashes when I bought them. These lashes are from Anastasia Beverly Hills. So hey, shout out girl. They looked like awesome on the Sephora website. Then I actually put them on my face and I was like, all you can see are eyelashes. So whatever, it's almost Halloween. I'm allowed to wear giant eyelashes. And that is exactly what I'm gonna be talking about today about women wearing whatever the hell they want all throughout history and just everybody's reactions to that. I am going to be talking about men making fun of women's fashion because this is a topic that I feel very strongly about and I have been wanting to do it for a long time. So buckle up, it's gonna be a ride, let's go. So when we talk about women's fashion throughout history, we can't really separate that from the concept of extravagance. Even if you've only watched my videos and this is like the only fashion history that you've ever learned in your entire life, you've probably caught on by now to the fact that women's fashion throughout history has been very, very extra, as the kids will say. There have been some periods in history where women's fashion was a little simpler and more pared down, but for the vast majority of history, women's clothing has been very complicated with a lot of complicated understructures to support it. So this concept of extravagance and complication has always been associated with femininity in like a traditional patriarchal system. This really began in the 1670s when a new style of gown emerged called the mantua. It hung from the shoulders and went down straight to the floor and the earliest styles were much looser and more comfortable than the heavily boned bodices and separated skirts that had been worn since the Elizabethan era. So the mantua gown was a big deal in fashion. It changed the course of clothing all throughout the 18th century and it was a radical departure from the big stiff ruffs of the Elizabethan era and the very unnaturally shaped bodices that women used to wear. In contrast, the mantua was loose and it was a lot more comfortable to wear because the mantua gown fit more like a robe and it had a much higher neckline and was more heavily trimmed than the off-the-shoulder relatively plain gowns of the earlier 17th century. In the 1600s, there was a lot of religious reform in Europe and even aristocratic dress had a very pared down look. Um, there was a little bit of extravagance sort of in the early 1600s at the tail end of the Elizabethan era, but throughout the, the 17th century, clothing gradually became more and more simple. Women would just cover their hair with simple, modest linen caps, and gowns were generally plain covered, although the fabric itself was very rich. Lots of silk satins were used, but the colors were plain and simple, and the cut and the construction of the gowns was also fairly simple. So 
In the 1670s, when the mantua gown became popular, this was a bit of a radical departure, and the cut of the gown allowed for these richly brocaded, heavily decorated fabrics to be more on display than they would have been in an earlier style of gown. Until the 1670s, complicated outer garments for both women and men had been made by tailors, who were almost always men, while women seamstresses produced undergarments like chemises and shirts. So women's fashion was basically dictated and made by men right up until the 1670s. So in 1675, under the reign of King Louis XIV in France, the law changed to allow women to make clothing for other women independent of male tailors. This led to the rise of female-dominated guilds in France for both milliners, who made accessories and hats, and mantua makers, so-called because they were the ones who made these mantua gowns. And eventually, these spread across the channel into England as well, although professional guilds in England were not really a thing to the extent that they were in France. While French women organized themselves professionally and kept extensive records of their working lives, women in England mostly worked out of the home or out of private shops, so there are fewer written records of the careers of middle class women in England at this time. However, the records that we do have of French women showed that they were able to make a lot of money as mantua makers because they knew women's bodies, and at the time, to have clothing made, you would have had to go to a mantua maker, and then she would have taken your measurements, and then she would have draped and fitted the fabric around your form, and that's how you would have had a gown made for yourself so there was no sewing machines there was no mass production there was no ready-made clothing so you would have several fittings just for one gown and so you would obviously get to know your seamstress and your mantua maker very well and so this became an intimate space where women could talk to their mantua makers in much the same way that we have that traditional association with like telling your hairdresser everything. It was kind of the same with your mantua maker in like the 1670s. So this became a very private space where women would collaborate and come up with fashions on their own. At the time, there were no trends or established fashions the same way that we think of them today. And so fashion was created when a woman got together with her mantua maker and they constructed a gown and trimmings together and the woman would tell the mantua maker what she wanted, what was to her taste. I want something more simple, natural, to wear in the garden. And then the mantua maker would make up a gown like that and then the woman would wear it out in public and create a sensation and then people would rush to copy her. So that was how fashion was made like right up until the early 1900s before it started becoming more mass produced. But before that, it was literally just women deciding what they wanted to wear and telling their seamstresses and having it made for them. So within a few decades, the milliners and mantua makers guilds in France became very wealthy and successful and the menfolk became a little bit salty about this. They tried really hard to stop the proliferation of these guilds and some tailors in England even tried to petition the Parliament to prosecute mantua makers so that tailors could keep their monopoly but the number of women who were gainfully employed in the fashion industry was actually good for the economy so alas the menfolk did not succeed and the mantua makers were allowed to continue making their mantua gowns obviously this created a lot of resentment with the male tailors who lost a lot of business to their female competitors and then there was also the creation of this private space that was just for women and the fact that women were starting to have more socioeconomic power so the menfolk were threatened and this is the beginnings of when men started making fun of women's fashion so the fashion industry was a source of gain Painful employment for women who suddenly found themselves with viable options outside of marriage and motherhood for the first time in modern history. A young woman was able to apprentice herself to a milliner or a mantua maker and develop her own career and sometimes even open her own shop later on when she became a master in the guild. So there was actually options for women to generate their own income and dictate the outcome of their own lives for the first time in modern history. So this was a really big deal and something that often gets overlooked in feminist discourse. Um, a lot of like modern feminist discourse talks about the first wave of feminism which started in the 1890s which i will touch on today as well but the actual history of women's socioeconomic independence goes back much much farther all the way to the end of the 1600s and that's not really talked about a lot because it has to do with fashion because fashion is actually what gave women their first throes of independence and that doesn't usually get discussed a lot except in costuming circles because mantua gowns are just a really fascinating object to study if you've ever had the fortune of seeing one in a museum it's quite the quite the spectacular thing to look at and uh, quite the innovation in terms of construction they were not made with 
patterns, usually tailored garments that were made by men, were made using flat patterns. So those were your jackets, your riding habits, your breeches, your trousers, but women's gowns were made by draping and cutting the fabric to mold and shape around a woman's body. And it was done specifically for each woman. So it was a very innovative way of creating a garment that a male tailor would not have necessarily thought of. So there's a lot to unpack in here. Um, maybe one day I'll do a video about mantua gowns in particular, but they were the source of women's first foray into economic independence in society. And some of these women did very well for themselves, the most famous being Rose Bertin, who became Marie Antoinette's personal stylist in the 1770s. She owned a famous shop in Paris called Le Grand Mogul, I'm sorry if I butchered the pronunciation of that, and she was at one point the wealthiest woman in France, owning more property and personal wealth than even the Queen herself, because the Queen of France was bankrupt at this time. Fascinating character, if you are at all interested in the history of fashion, you absolutely have to look her up. She's so cool. Um, anyways, the, the right, yes, hello, Bonsai. You want to come sit on my lap? Hi, sweetheart. Mommy's filming her video right now. Mommy's filming. Yeah, can you go sleep in your bed? Can you go sleep in your bed, please? Yeah, that's a good point. The rise of an industry dominated by women coincided with the emergence and spread of print media, especially in England in the early 18th century. And this is where we start to see the sartorial cartoons emerge. All right, come here, come here. All right. Oh, oh goodness. Okay. All right. You want to sit on my lap? You want to sit on my lap? Okay, you can sit on my lap. What are you doing, Bonsai? Oh. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. Are you comfy now? Are you comfy? Okay, I'm not comfy, but you're comfy, so that's good. All right. So during the 18th century, the very early beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and a boom in trade meant that more people could attain middle class status and afford more fashionable clothing. Women working for themselves and earning a decent independent income also allowed them to purchase gowns and keep up with fashions that their mothers and grandmothers would only have been able to dream of. Fashionable clothes were no longer only for the very wealthy, which meant that public awareness of fashion and fashion trends was also growing. Unfortunately, this also meant that fashion was more susceptible to ridicule, especially by men who were the ones creating the cartoons, because women were still largely barred from entering the literary world, though they had found a lot of economic success in the fashion world. The sartorial cartoons started in the 18th century when the poof came into fashion, which was a very tall hairstyle augmented with false hair and sometimes wire frames that held the whole ensemble in place. Poofs were decorated with all manner of flowers, fruits, vegetables, ribbons, jewels, even entire pastoral scenes complete with running water and figurines. Poofs were used to express emotions, important events in the life of the wearer, and certain political leanings. When Marie Antoinette successfully convinced her husband to get inoculated for smallpox, which was still a risky venture in the 18th century, she wore a poof to celebrate the occasion. Satirical cartoonists went wild with this trend, ridiculing what was seen as a silly aristocratic fashion, and they basically didn't stop for like 200 years. Isaac Cruikshank was a prominent caricaturist in the early 1800s who targeted the revealing translucent gowns made of Indian muslin that were popular in the early 19th century. And if you want to know more about those gowns, see the video that I posted a few weeks ago on agency fashion and what that was all about because you'll learn a lot about why men still made fun of this particular fashion even though it was a lot simpler and more practical than fashions of the past had been. It was rumored that women in the Regency era would dampen their gowns to enhance their transparency, leading to illness and death in the winter. This is completely a rumor and I've never been able to find any actual evidence of this, so if anyone knows a good primary source that will settle this once and for all, uh, please drop me a comment and let me know because I would love to see it. And I can name like five other fashion historians and costumers who would also love to see some primary research on this, so if you have it, please drop it in the comments and make me famous, K thanks. So our friend Isaac Cruikshank found these fashions to be ridiculous and impractical 
And keep those two words in mind, ridiculous, ridiculous and, impractical, and impractical, because they basically sum up men's attitudes towards fashion throughout the 18th, 19th, and even 20th centuries. It's getting better now, thanks Harry Styles, but for a long time, men just thought that women were completely ridiculous with what they wore, and this was just sort of a prevailing sexist attitude that floated on the air, kind of like smallpox itself. In the 1830s, when big poofy sleeves and excessive trimmings came back into fashion after a 40-year hiatus, the cartoonists went feral with the new silhouettes, mocking the large sleeves and elaborate hairstyles that were fashionable at the time. And the mid-19th century got no recourse either, when the cage crinoline was invented, allowing women to shed their layers of petticoats and still retain a large skirt circumference, male cartoonists poked fun at that too. By the 1890s, women were beginning to gain more freedom, not just economically, but politically and socially as well. It became fashionable for women to play sports, and cycling in particular became a favorite activity. Now, it was at this time when we start to see a really big change in women's fashion and in men's attitudes towards women's fashion as well. This coincided with the Victorian dress reform or rational dress movement, which was popular with middle class women who were involved in first wave feminism. And it was also heavily endorsed by Oscar Wilde, who published an essay called The Philosophy of Dress that was really popular amongst women who were proponents of the rational dress movement. So the rational dress movement called for the emancipation of women from the complicated corseted fashions of the late 1890s and the early Edwardian period. And they were successful <coughs> Right, guys. And they were successful in persuading women to wear simpler, sometimes even bifurcated garments for sports. Hence the flame, fl flamous? Hence, hence the flamous. That's a new one. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm just making up words. Hence the famous split skirt for cycling that's popular with reenactors today. Yes, everyone is just fascinated with the cycling split skirt. I can see why because it's a rather complicated garment to actually construct. I've never tried it just because I don't really have an interest in it at this point in time. I may yet develop an interest in it. Who knows, who knows where my costuming journey will take me, but I just have not really been able to summon up enough interest to actually like draft a pattern and make a split skirt. Um, but like I said, who knows? The backlash against traditional feminine dress in the 1890s largely came from male preachers and doctors who criticized the practice of tight lacing, which was an extreme fashion that was practiced by a handful of very wealthy and glamorous women. Tight lacing is basically exactly what it sounds like, essentially just lacing your corset down as tightly as it will go so that your waist appears as small as possible. I want to emphasize that only a handful of very wealthy women ever did this, and the vast majority of regular everyday women went about their lives working and playing sports in comfortably laced corsets. However, there was a general hysteria amongst doctors and preachers about the effect of tight lacing on women's health and fertility emphasis on fertility. God forbid we don't bear those babies. Society's just gonna crumble without the babies, guys. And a lot of first wave feminists jumped on this bandwagon demanding more comfortable and sensible clothing. So something that doesn't get talked about a lot is the fact that many first wave feminists were very deeply religious. Early feminism also heavily promoted deeply Christian values of temperance and biblical morality, and fashionable clothing became associated with moral depravity and hedonism. It was the devil's playground, you guys. What's the, like the taste of butter? A pretty dress. Um, we like to think of our favorite suffragette heroines as being radical and unconventional. Never underestimate the power we women have to define our own destiny. And at least politically, they definitely were. However, in the spheres of home and church, many of them were deeply traditional, and a lot of rational dress backlash against fashion sounds awfully similar to the early 17th century Puritan distaste for anything that wasn't strictly utilitarian. Early feminists believed that a change in dress could change women's position in society and give them greater freedom, social mobility, and independence from men in marriage. Interesting that only a century ago, fashionable dress was the thing that allowed women to earn their own incomes for the first time in history, but we just all forgot about that and went like, oh my gosh, those horrible hedonistic women who are tight lacing their corsets 
and affecting their fertility and not being able to bear children for God and country, how dare they? So this was, again, a very patriarchal, puritanical kind of thing, but it suited the political agenda of the suffragettes, so they ran with it. The rational dress movement ultimately failed, though, and it wasn't until the 1920s that a true relaxation of women's clothes became widespread, with the popularity of short skirts, jersey fabric, and a change in undergarments, as in they didn't wear as many of them. So there's actually very little evidence of men making fun of the outfits worn by early feminists who were involved in the rational dress movement. Editing Megan here, uh, just wanting to point out that there were a lot of cartoons of men making fun of suffragettes, however, the ridicule centered on the politics of women who wanted to vote in particular, rather than what they were wearing or their outfits. So it still sucked, it was still sexist and misogynistic, but it wasn't directed at what women were actually wearing, it was directed at their politics. There certainly was a little, but not to the extent that it had happened in previous decades and centuries. My theory is that it's because because this pared down, simple clothing soothed irrational male fears about fashion affecting women's fertility and symbolizing an unchristian hedonism and desire for worldly things that was associated with depravity and moral failing. It also embodied patriarchal masculine values, masculine values of simplicity and practicality, making women appear more like men. Even though women's fashions have changed time and time and time again throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, we still retain a hint of our Victorian ancestors' distaste for high fashion. It's still seen as being silly and hedonistic, despite the highly specialized technical skills and creative talents needed to design and produce a line of clothing at a high-end atelier. Now, there are a lot of very valid criticisms of the modern fashion industry, not least of which include the fact that it's extremely wasteful, environmentally destructive, and employs workers at poverty wages and sweatshops in third world countries. However, underneath all of those very real and very awful things that we need to address, there is still a hint of that Victorian distaste for those silly women and their silly fashions just being silly and not very smart. This is an underlying sense that you get from a lot of modern media and TV shows. I'd like to see you have a little bit of direction. I have direction. Yeah, towards the mall. And this is because frivolity and hedonism are still closely associated with femininity, and many women today have internalized the misogynistic attitudes that have surrounded women's clothing since the rise of the mantua makers in the 1600s. Every bite and curtain drawn, I want to taste with you. And you can see this very clearly in the absolute clusterfuck of problematic, not like other girls tropes that dominate modern movies and TV shows, embodied in female leads like Bridgerton's Eloise and Anne Shirley from Anne with an E, who turn their noses up at fashion in order to be taken seriously by men. Now, the not like other girls trope is something that drives me effing crazy. Abby Cox did a really good video on this, so I'm gonna link that below. I think I linked one of her videos in uh, my last video as well. She's just awesome, go check out her channel. So the not like other girls trope was really big in like the late 2010s, but thankfully over the last couple of years has come under scrutiny as being yet another example of internalized misogyny and people are starting to realize the extent to which that is actually very misogynistic. I'm sure some of you have even noticed and if you are kind of a girly girl for lack of a better word like I am, I'm sure that it's also bothered you. My point in all of this is that men have ridiculed and poked fun at women's clothing for 400 years, ever since women began to seriously challenge their monopoly in creating it. And for some reason, we as modern women bend ourselves around these casually misogynistic attitudes, even adopting them ourselves. They're so different. And taking care not to appear too flamboyant, lest we scare off all the men folk and end up not being taken seriously by them. God forbid we frighten the men folk. This is why I will argue to my dying breath that Legally Blonde is the ultimate feminist movie and Elle Woods is the feminist hero that we 21st century women need. She enthusiastically embraces the colors and clothing that make her feel good, even though they don't fit in with her environment, and demands to be taken seriously by her Harvard Law School professors and peers, even though she doesn't fit in with their preconceived ideas about what a serious law student should look like. She kicks ass at Harvard, befriends her ex-fiance's new girlfriend, and wins a high-profile case that her sex professor had turned his nose up at, going on to become valedictorian at her graduation. Not that this entire thing was leading up to a plug for Legally Blonde, but it just really bothers me how women are not taken seriously 
based on what we wear still today in the year 2022 because of these casually misogynistic and sexist attitudes that have prevailed ever since the 1600s and come from men's deep distaste of women taking economic and social control back from them to actually create their own fashions and wear whatever the fuck we want to wear. So this is something that deeply bothers me. But as someone who loves clothes and loves fashion and loves history, I have actually experienced this firsthand in my life. I have been let go from jobs before because I chose to dress flamboyantly at work when everyone else in the office was wearing Pam Beasley type attire and I didn't fit in with the company culture. So that should never have happened. I mean, that's just not that I'm like salty about those particular instances, but I'm just, I, I'm just salty about the fact that it is the year 2022 and women are still being discriminated against for what we choose to wear or not to wear. I mean, look at, for, look at Iran, what's going on there right now. Like men have been dictating what we wear and what we can't wear for absolute millennia. And it's time that we took back our power and stood up and said, no, listen, if I wanna wear a bustle gown at a board meeting, I'm gonna freaking do that and you're gonna take me seriously. If I wanna wear hoop skirts out for dinner, you're gonna move that table aside to make room for my fucking crinoline, okay? I should be able to do that and be taken just as seriously as the guy sitting next to me or the woman in the business suit. So anyways, until we can wear bustles and hoop skirts and corsets and ball gowns and pajamas and whatever the fuck else we want while we conduct business meetings, lead seminars, teach classes, show up at the office or march in the streets and still be taken 100% seriously, we still have work to do, a lot of work. Okay and rant for now. I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks again for getting me to 300 subscribers. I am so excited about that. And uh, I'll be back in a couple weeks with some project updates for y'all. Toodaloo.